So when we um, we've been talking with the awesome organizers of this end wave about you know what we might do to make a contribution to this end wave, we came up with this idea that we might discuss data issues that arise from our interactions with especially with this community, but also with other research communities that use uh, shared data. Um, we thought we would target this towards students and early career researchers, but of course it also may be relevant for people who are uh, practiced hands at data creation when they're moving into a new field or doing their kind of collection and then so maybe they would find something else for us. Um, our credentials, uh, in case you don't know us, LDC is the first and largest data center devoted to mining resources. We've uh, built about 800, a little over 800 corpora um, that we distribute to 6,400 organizations worldwide uh, in many countries, and we've been able to hand verify that there are 10,000, more than 10,000 papers that use LDC data sets. There's probably a larger number than that if you a Google Scholar search, but these are the ones you can check by hand and verify that it's true. Uh, and maybe also interestingly, we support a number of what are called common task evaluation programs. These are programs where several people are trying to develop technologies using the same data set and the same metric for evaluating score. And this becomes an interesting model for shareability. This enforces shareability in these communities. It becomes an interesting model to compare to other communities that don't have that need, but do have the need for comparability and shareability. And then uh, in terms of our own personal credentials, so my training is a lot like the training of many of you in the room. I have my degree from Kent in social linguistics, so I have been working at the LDC ever since. Denise has a JD, which is a law degree, and she has uh, been managing LDC external relations for the past 14 years, so that means she handles uh, data distribution, curation, intellectual property, institutional review board, all these issues that you face when you begin in the collection. And James has his PhD in English, but we won't hold that against him. He's got a master's in linguistics. Uh, he was one of the first cohorts of fellows at Penn's shiny new Price Lab for Digital Humanities. And he's the project manager on our new project, which I'll, for which we had a poster yesterday, and which we'll also mention briefly today. So those are our credentials. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about um, are models that people seem to have, mental models people seem to have about data-intensive research. So people won't necessarily admit to this model, but when they talk about doing research, they seem to have this model in their head, which is they do some planning, and then they do write a proposal, and sometimes they apply for support, sometimes they don't, and then they collect some data, and then they say stuff like, my data collection's done, now I can finally do my research. And I would argue, actually, that um, a couple things about that model are maybe too simplistic. So first of all, I would argue that everything that you're doing along the way is actually part of the research endeavor. Because decisions you make while you're planning and writing your proposal have impact on how you do your collection. And in fact, sometimes you learn things in, in the process of, uh, in subsequent processes like doing your collection that cause you to rethink the way you're planning your research. So, in, in, in one sense, everything that you're doing here is part of the research endeavor, and also that these um, links here uh, sometimes move backward, that is, sometimes will cause you to rethink decisions that you've made earlier based upon the discovery as you go through. And hopefully you don't go too far through, hopefully you don't get to the, say, coding and writing up your findings, and uh, then you realize that you haven't recruited the right people. Um, now let's talk about for a minute, we'll, we'll talk about data almost always in the context of sharing data or, or using shared data. And so we might ask first the question, why share your data and why use somebody else's data that's been shared? And there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, uh, increasingly funds require it, so this is already true of the U.S. National Science Foundation and as, as I understand it also of the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council that if you're getting funded by them, you should be sharing your data. There are steps in place to be sure that this is true. And the uh, White House Office of Science Technology Policy under the last administration published a letter that they circulated to all U.S. funding agencies that fund more than a certain dollar value saying that they have to add new policies in place to assure that if they're funding someone that data is being shared at the lowest possible cost, with the lowest barrier to produce, even for people use. Uh, some journals and conferences are beginning to require or encourage it. So LREC, for example, is also asking questions every year about the shareability of your data when you submit your proposal. You're supposed to answer questions about the shareability of your data at that point. But also because it promotes good science. That is, it allows for the possibility of replication, uh, it allows for the possibility of comparing results across two different communities. 
Uh, and of course, uh, most important for this community, it allows you to study change over time by looking at some uh, collections that were done, in, say, in your community previous to your collection. Mm -hmm. to your collection. It also increases the possibility of collaboration and specialization. So you know from your own research groups that some of you are very good at looking at the literature and understanding the models, and others of you are very good at getting elbows deep into prot scripts or Python code. And by sharing data, it actually allows people to specialize in what they're good at um, across the whole community rather than just inside of a, inside of a lab. Uh, it lowers barriers to entry for new participants, although I'm not going to argue that any sociolinguist should avoid going into the field at least once, but, it, but you might be able to avoid going to the field the second or third time because there may be data that you can get from someone else that helps uh, supplement your own field work. And because the research community desires it. So since we're here at Oregon, I've got this quote from Kendall and uh, Van Herk where they say that the old model that data was too valuable to part with is being replaced by a new model where data is too valuable not to share it. Um, but I would also argue that most importantly, it sharpens your own research practices. So if you are working in isolation and you're the only person who sees what you're doing with your data, you're maybe not quite as careful if you know that your data is about to be shared with somebody else and they're going to see every single decision that you make. I think that's actually a good discipline to put yourself through, to work as though someone else is watching and looking over your shoulder because increasingly they are in this sense of truth. And finally, if you're old-fashioned enough to care about these such things, it, it's a good thing to do just on the face. <clears throat> we'll talk about five conditions for shared data. There are many people who come up with different conditions on what constitutes good shareable data. There's the fair principles and the fact principles, but I'll use this set as compromising birds and signs. Uh, so uh, shared data should be discoverable, which means that somebody should be able to find it and to evaluate its relevance to their work before they get covered. So the, the documentation should describe how relevant it is to their work. And that this should be possible without having a personal relationship with the person who created the data. This is important. So this old model of you got data because you knew the person who created it is being increasingly replaced with a model of you should be able to get data without having that relationship with the person. Uh, that the data should be accessible, which means that there are open terms and procedures which state clearly and also in advance how you would get access to data and preferably that would be direct access through something like a persisting URL or UID. That it's interpretable, which means that you can understand the data independently of being the person who created it. That somebody else inside the creator can understand the data. Um, and it's understandable to the target community without need for any kind of special resources, like you shouldn't have to get consultation from the creator to understand how to use the data. Um, that's portable, which means interoperable in the user's working environment, not in the creator's working environment. An environment in this case means hardware, software, uh, community, and practices. Uh, and if this use open and transparent uh, formats. And then finally, this is probably the most important, that a faithful copy of the original data and metadata is stored somewhere where it's constantly being checked against BitRot, right? It's not sitting on the server where nobody's ever looking at it. It's being checked to be sure that it's not bit, bit rotting away. Um, and it's protected against contingencies like the destruction of a server that it's sitting on or the retirement of a faculty member or Amazon decides they, want, they don't want to be in that business anymore and they move on to something else. It should be protected against these contingencies uh, through multiple sites and backups and, and these kinds of things. Also, that fixes should be applied as patches, right? Because if you're trying to compare your work against some previously published study, you need to know the data has stayed the same. So somebody should not be correcting the data in some way you can't track, because that means you can't, you can't compare against the original data. Just to give an example of what I mean by portability, uh, if you learn how to program, the very first thing you're asked to do is write a program that says Hello World. I simply typed Hello World into a popular word processing system. Uh, and then I opened that word processing system in something else that isn't that proprietary piece of software. This is non portability. In case you wanted to see what it looks like, this is what it looks like. <laughs> if somebody has to buy this, some, some people can't afford this piece of software. Some people would just politically not want to use it or, or philosophically not want to use it. Uh, this is non portable. Uh, and you know we have many experiences where we get data sets from people that are in this format, and the very first thing we do is convert it into something else, so that you can read it with regardless of what you have. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, lots of times when we get data corrections from people, we'll listen to the audio and we'll say, "Oh, we can't really get the spectrograms out of this audio, or, or our, um, our force alignment isn't working that well. You know, how did you collect this data?" And the answer is almost always something like, "Well, I don't know about microphones. You just tell me what microphones to use. I'll use that, and then the next data collection will be better." 
And what I want to say about that is that uh, income choice is probably the least important thing of all these decisions that you're making to do in collection. There's many more things that can destroy a collection besides the wrong microphone. In fact, it's almost it's actually difficult these days to buy the wrong microphone. Uh, first question you have to answer yourself is: Does your collection re represent your research goals accurately? And we'll come back to this a couple times in the future. But you also have to ask these questions about whether your underlying assumptions about the collection are appropriate, and you <coughs> understand what your assumptions are. So, how much control are you are you willing and do you believe you should exert over yourself or the interviewer? So, in my own data, for example, I had to do interviews, um, but I also had to a native speaker, I was a non-native speaker of the language, so possibly a neutral person in the community, possibly not influencing the decision about whether to use a higher or lower form of the language. Uh, but I also didn't want my non-native status to lead me out of you know, some possible discussions in dialect, for example. And so I hired a native speaker, but then you have to ask the question, does the native speaker now impose some kind of conditions over the collection that I don't? And at least in my own data, the answer is yes. The native speaker belongs to a certain dialect area and was also known in the community, but also went on and was educated and was a school teacher and maybe in fact people were tending to use more prestige forms speaking to her than to me. This is the kind of question you need to think about when you're doing collection for yourself, but also for comparability to other studies and also for shareability to other studies. How much control are you going to exert over the speaker um, and the situation, the room and the noise? So some of you do phonetics or uh, uh, socio-phonetics and you really care about sound quality and you would like to stick a person in the room and strap them down so they don't move and put a microphone bowl, a microphone to their head and you get really good quality data, but as you know, this impacts the quality of the interaction. Others of you would prefer to go into the field. You need to think about the, those decisions and how they impact the shareability, the comparability of your data, especially if you're trying to do is replicate somebody else's study or compare uh, some kind of um, uh, variable process in your community versus in somebody else's community. Because those decisions, differences in those decisions can affect the comparability. Um, then you can talk about things like recording parameters, which can which can affect the quality of the study. But it, it's not until you get all the way down to the bottom of the list that you start thinking about things like the microphone. Although that's often the thing that people ask us about first, is what microphone should I buy. I would argue that actually usability and compatibility of microphone is more important. So can you, whoever's taking the recorder into the field, actually use it effectively and prevent clipping and prevent and, and point it in the right direction and uh, avoid the uh, proximity effect when you actually do that? If you don't understand what those are, then you probably if you have a microphone that's susceptible to those effects and you don't understand, you probably should pick the less sophisticated microphone to be honest. Um, yeah, so the operating parameters are important. And then finally, after all of that, I would say the last of those things is the make and model and the pickup pattern of the microphone. It's the least important of all those things. But finally, I would point out the comparability. Again, if you're trying to plot the data set because you want to compare with somebody else's data set, you might ask the question, is my recording setup comparable? So there have been some studies like the one by um, uh, Paul Decker and John Nitsch, where they show some differences in recording conditions um, that impact their analysis after they do forced alignment and, and, and run uh, valve form extraction. They get different results when they use some kinds of data collected and, and transformed in one way versus another. Um, we can talk about coded schemes too. So, um, in addition to share, it's your ability to share this data, the methodology that methodology that you use impacts your efficiency, which impacts the scale on which you can do research, which impacts the kinds of questions you can ask. Right? If you're spending all your time just transcribing and coding data, you've got less time to, to do that again for another feature, for another variable. It affects your accuracy and consistency, but also things like balance. So, uh, did you know? Did you start by listening for some feature, and then you got really tired about halfway through the hour-long interview, and so all your coders are from the beginning of the interview and not the end of the interview? Or, um, you know, did you did you capture the dynamics, the fact that over the course of the interview, your relationship with the person you're interviewing is actually changing over time, and so you know, do you have balance across it? Do you control for the duration and the effect of the uh, getting to know the person during the interview. Uh, and the decision points um, that you make, here's a number of decision points that you make that also affect your ability to compare your data with somebody else's data and, to, and things you have to document so that somebody else, when they take your data, can actually understand it. So what's the nature of your variable, obviously? How is it modeled? Did you model it as continuous or discrete or uh, categorical? And do you see it as a feature of running all by itself or is it part of a larger phenomenon? 
So if you look at the history of TD deletion, for example, studies vary across whether they see TD deletion as a thing onto itself, early studies, or part of a larger phenomenon of remission. Um, what are the independent variables or factor groups that you're going to consider? Also, how do you model those? So uh, what are the possible values that you associate with the independent variables? And I'll, and I'll show you a graph on this in the next slide. How do you sample both talkers and also situations and also tokens within a recording? Uh, and what are the features by which you make those decisions? And then finally, how do you elicit them? And these are all relevant, so I'll show you. This one, which is a kind of synthesization of, I don't know, 50 papers on TV deletion, um, looking at just the question of uh, following environment and preceding environment. So some papers will do things like look at the following environment as contents versus liquids versus flags versus vowels. Some of them will merge, so they'll have contents versus everything else. Some will have vowels versus everything else. In this graph, if you look at it, um, the colors, so if, if, uh, in that first column, uh, the fact that consonant and vowel are both the same color means that there is no significant, significant difference found in their effect on TD deletion in those studies. The next column over uh, shows that consonants have an effect separately from non-consonants. The next one over says vowels have an effect differently from non-vowels. These studies are not comparable with each other. You can only compare within a, within a column. Because you don't know, although this graph would suggest it, you don't know whether the proportion of liquids, glides, and vowels are the same in that non-consonant category, or the proportion of consonants, liquids, and glides are the same in that non-vowel. You can't compare those studies, right? You just don't know. If your results are different from the results of some other study you're looking at, it could be that your data is different, it could be that your community is different, it could just be that your model is different. What if almost all of the non-consonants in that case are vowels? Then you'd expect it to show different based on the left-hand side of the grid. What if they were almost all your non-consonants or almost all liquids, then you would expect no significant difference based on the left-hand side of the grid. These are the cost the issue. And then the same thing here, except worse, looking at TD deletion and proceeding and all the different ways in which they not. Um, <clears throat> in the opposite, uh, instead of uh, people from this community coming to us and asking us for advice, we've actually come to this community before and asked for advice on coding um, uh, demographic situation attitudinal data. And we've run a couple of workshops, Malka Yeager and I ran three workshops on this question. And the interesting answer that we got from people in this community was it's more complicated. We, we asked, you know, can we come up with some kind of cookbook or roughly a recipe for eliciting demographic situational attitudinal data so we can move beyond community studies and do kind of na national studies in some way that is general <coughs> And the answer was, it's kind of too difficult to give you an answer right now. Let's look at the issues instead. And a couple, there are many papers. In fact, you can read these papers in the 2014 issue of Language, um, um, uh, language and Linguistics Com uh, Commons. Um, but a couple of the interesting things we found is that, um, of course, demographics isn't static. This is what we heard in the papers over and over again. We used to historically treat demographics as, as a static feature of a speaker. Um, but we heard papers over and over again saying people move back and forth between different demographic <coughs> to move between different demographic categories, depending upon the people with whom they're associated. So there are people who are both Latina and African American, and when they're with their Latina friends, they sound like their Latina friends, and when they're African American friends, they sound like their African American friends. And if you're modeling them as one or the other, you're missing an important danger. You're, you're mismodeling them. But also we heard that the nature of the elicitation matters, right? So um, how are you finding out what, what groups people associate with? Are you mining the conversation to find this out? Are you asking them in a survey? Or, uh, and is that survey written? Or is that survey, are you asking these questions out loud? The form of the question matters, and also the form in which you allow them to give answers matters. So if I ask you what's your religion, you might give me one answer. If I say you're not Catholic, are you? You might give me a different answer. If I say something like I'm a Christian, what about you? You might give me yet a third answer. The form of this question matters. Also, how you perceive me as the asker of the question could matter, right? Uh, so we learned that all these things matter, and so it's important to document the conditions under which you've elicited this kind of metadata, uh, both for making it possible for somebody to share your data, but also for understanding the data that you may be getting from someone else when you're trying to uh, comparison. I'll just spend a few minutes in introducing a project that LDC has been working on, and then if people have questions, we can talk more about it. Um, so this project is, it's, you saw there's a new NIE 
W, it's for using novel incentives in data collection and linguistic annotation. Our motivation was a, a, to find a way to supplement traditional methods of particularly large data collections and annotation, and traditional methods essentially meaning applying for a grant to get money and paying people to do, make judgments or make annotations. So we wanted to look at uh, novel incentives as a way to supplement these traditional methods. And by novel incentives, we mean some of these non-monetary incentives that include access to information, entertainment, self-expression, developing a skill, competition, status, contributing to a greater cause or good. And why do we think that people may do this? Well, there's been lots of successful examples out there, many of which um, I'm sure a lot of you know about. Just a couple quick ones that have been very successful. LibriVox, if anyone knows LibriVox, which was is a volunteer effort for people to read books, to make audiobooks for public domain books. And they have over 9,000 volunteers. They, they created audiobooks of over 13,000 books in 39 languages, and these are all freely available. And it's all done with volunteer effort. Uh, Zooniverse is a, is a popular citizen science um, uh, organization that you may have heard, heard of. It's typically for hard sciences, but they also do some social sciences as well. And this is an online platform to allow people to contribute to scientific research. It tends to be things like classification. So for example, um, Galaxy Zoo was a project where researchers would put up images of galaxies and they would ask the crowd to uh, the citizen science and the crowdsources to uh, categorize the morphology of the galaxy. So is it a sphere, is it a spiral? Um, so classification projects are popular. Also, they do have some transcription projects like Shakespeare's World, where they, people have they would show you images from diaries from the Renaissance, and the people would transcribe the, um, transcribe the, the diaries. So Zooniverse is, is very popular. It has over 1.9 million contributors. Um, in their time, and they've had, they currently have over 200 projects, 100 are active, and the others have been completed. Um, another thing you might have heard of is games of a purpose. Um, these are sort of various kinds of games where it, people play it because it's entertaining, but in the process they're doing some kind of work. So a, a famous one is the ESP game, which then Google, not surprisingly, bought uh, to make the Google image labeler, or something you may have done Google image labeler when it was out. And this is sort of a competitive activity to create labels for it, uh, an image, and it, in the, in the, um, the outcome of, of the plan is Google got you to label images to help their, their image search engine. Um, so that's how you get games of a purpose. So these are some of the models that have been successful that, that we are, we're imitating for uh, more specifically linguistic purposes. So we applied for a National Science Foundation uh, research infrastructure grant, meaning it's not a research grant, it's to create infrastructure for the research community, so we are creating this for you. Um, and we got a planning grant uh, for one year, and then we have a three-year grant, which we're currently moving into our third year of the NSF grant. So we are building an infrastructure, which means a toolkit, online portals to create linguistic annotation and collection activities for the research community. We are using, we're building upon a software package that LDC has been using for a decade to do linguistic annotation in-house. Um, we're essentially using that as a starting point and then we're simplifying it so it's a little easier for the researcher to build an activity, an annotation activity, and also the interface is um, streamlined for a non-professional or non-expert to be able to do linguistic annotation since we're trying to reach uh, non-experts, non-linguists. Um, and we, we, um, we go along with this idea of incentive models. We pitched that we were going to have three different, um, three different portals for this, right? That each match to an incentive model. They're not mutually exclusive, but we think that we, we identified three large-scale groups that we think we could tailor specific portals and activities to. One being gamers, so people who are interested in playing games. The second being citizen scientists or citizen linguists, as we're calling them. And then the third being uh, language teachers and students. So we have okay, so essentially three different three different portals. One is for dedicated to language games, and I'll go over these real quickly in a second. One is dedicated towards this idea of a citizen scientist, and then one is for language teachers and students uh, to, to you do these activities sort of in a classroom um, environment. So our language games portal is up and available. You can go to it now. It's lingoboingo.org. Uh, it's, also, it's also designed to be 
use, use on mobile, so it's mobile friendly. And this is a website that has, currently have nine different language themes on it, and these are done in collaboration with partners at other universities, University of Essex, the Siobhan. Um, and so that's available, you can go play these games now. LVC has created um, a game called Name That Language, which is inspired by the Great Language Game. Some of you may know, remember the Great Language Game. You can go to it, it's namethatlanguage.org, and it's a game where you listen to an audio clip and you have to identify the language that the clip is in. Um, this is our new version of it. You can go to it now. The, the visual is an older version. We sort of re, re, redid the design to be more visually appealing. So this will be implemented soon, but you can go play it. It just doesn't look exactly like that. Um, and so the, the portal that's probably even more relevant to, to you is our citizen science portal. Um, we call this Language Arc, with the Arc standing for Analysis Research Community. And there's really two, two main components of it. So one is the researchers like yourselves who can create linguistic activities and projects um, on this portal. And then the second group is actually the citizen linguists, so the participants who will go to this portal, become part of the community, and participate in the tasks and projects that researchers put up on this website. There are message boards, social media connections, so it really is about developing a community of participants who are interested in helping science, contributing to linguistics, contributing to their language and culture, um, and you can create different projects on there and then have, have the different participants um, do those projects. We, um, there is, there is a project builder, so when this is available to, to researchers like yourself, you don't have to code, you don't have to write HTML, you don't have to do CSS, you just answer some questions, upload your data, and it'll create, it'll create the tool for you. So we, we try to keep it as simple and streamlined as possible. And for this is just one example of a project you create. This is uh, sort of a classification project where uh, someone will listen to an audio clip and they have to make some kind of judgment about that audio clip. This one is an Italian. Um, dialect projects, and we play a clip of, of someone speaking Italian, and the, the participant would have to uh, identify a standard regional or dialect. Um, there's lots of other kinds of activities you could do. You could do um, translation activities, you could do elicitation, transcription, um, other types of audio uploads, so people could do image descriptions or upload themselves reading a story. Um, so there's lots of ways to collect both linguistic data and then also judgments about that data. Um, so right now, I said the lingo board of the game portal is up. You can go to it and play, play a bunch of fun language games. The language arc citizen science portal, we did a soft release to try to get some feedback from the research community. The official release should be within a month. When it's officially released, it'll only have projects that LDC has created to start. Um, pretty soon after that, it might be another few months after that, we'll open it up for the research community to create their own projects on there. If you have something that's more time sensitive, Please get in touch and we can build it for you um, until the project builder. There's still a few more things we want to fix on the project builder so it works smoothly for creating the projects. And then the language uh, pros for teachers and students is what we're working on this last year of the grants. We want to build a similar kind of portal and platform that's more geared towards use in a classroom environment within a curriculum for teaching linguistics to students. Um, that's it. And if, if you have questions about it, I'm happy to go over it and work with you. What I'm going to do, we're going to have a little um, rolling tour through some, um, through some topics that you'll want to address once you've started to flesh out your research proposal. And as you'll see, when we run through these things, the idea is, is that it's all going to somehow come together or will come together in the data management plan, which is the mechanism that many funders are using um, to uh, fulfill their data sharing requirement. So first, whenever data is collected from humans through some intervention or interaction, that's going to trigger in the United States the federal regulations governing human subjects collections. So what that means from your perspective is that you will have to submit uh, a research protocol that will, have, that will be approved by your university's institutional review board. Um, and those um, boards sit, every board is different. So you want to um, contact you or be in touch with your internal resources at your institution in terms of how the process goes and what you need to do. Um, the human subjects regulations are based on something called the common rule, and that rule is, is, is based in turn on three principles, respect for persons, beneficence, which means do no harm, and justice, which means that your research has to be transparent. What data are you collecting? How is it going to be used and shared? 
And one of the things that IRBs are interested in knowing is, are you focusing on any vulnerable public populations, which actually means in, the, in terms of the regulations, prisoners and pregnant women, which sounds funny, but for some studies that could be relevant. Um, informed consent, how, how transparent how, is, is your explanation to people what the study is and how their data will be used, and then how is sensitive information going to be treated. Now, in, in, in social science generally and in, in, in the field of linguistics, there's been this notion that IRBs are an obstacle to research because I have to do this protocol, I have to go to this board, these people don't understand what I do. And in, in linguists, there was something that people were talking about as the linguist fieldwork problem. And there was a, a nice article um, by Claire Bowern in, in 2002 in Language where she did a survey um, and asking researchers really how how, how hard was it you know, for you to get your research off the ground? And she concluded that most people's research was approved and the studies were able to go forward, but there's no question that there are some horror stories out there about IRB experiences uh, and a lot of anecdotal evidence which suggests that some IRBs were like, you have to destroy the data, you can't keep it after the study, or you can never collect from children, things like that. So, um, so be aware, I think the thing to be aware of as you approach your, your board is to remember that, for better or worse, the, the orientation of institutional review boards is to clinical and biomedical research. So sometimes it's hard for the board members to kind of get their head in the space of social science research, minimal risk studies like the kinds of things that this community does. And, so, and that can also play into these aversions to data sharing ideas. But having said that, we're all aware of open data initiatives, open science initiatives, the whole idea of data sharing now that government sponsors and other funders require. So I think I think the, I think you may I think the feeling is is that IRBs are, are moving around are moving toward having a more uh, open idea to overuse that word about data sharing, and that's reflected in some recent changes to the common rule. Common rule has been around for like 40 years, so having a change actually come into play, and this last change took like three three good years to actually become final after three years of comments. Um, it, did, it did determine that some studies are exempt from human subjects research, which is good news for communities like ours who deal with minimal risk um, collections. Um, however, if you're still going to, you still really want to have some consent process uh, so that you're able to, first of all, um, have, let people know how you're collecting the data and then how it's going to be shared and used that you want in any event, whether an IRB gets involved or not. But one of the areas, a new exemption is called the nine behavioral interventions, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. It hasn't been explicitly defined in the regulations, but there are some examples that have been given, and those <clears throat> include playing an online game, solving a puzzle, and doing some simple cognitive tasks. So I think it's going to be the case in a, on a, on a board-specific um, inquiry, like how a particular board will look at this. But I think this is good news for this community because I think a lot of activities that, um, that are done may actually fall within that exemption. Um, and certain scholarly and journalistic activities have, are exempt. So that means oral histories are exempt, but ethnographic studies are not. And the idea there is that still any kind of study that's going to involve observation of a particular community or people is still something that the that boards will want to look at. Um, something that's been explicitly recognized in the new regulations is tribal rights. And I think this community is very aware, and certainly those of you working in indigenous languages or other resource languages have come across this, that you may have to be talking to language communities who have their own IRBs or other processes for approvals. But what the common rule now recognizes is that researchers have to take account of these and follow these procedures. Um, but again, most language studies are considered to be minimal risk, and that means from the board perspective, it's going to be conducted under an expedited review. So once you get your application together, hopefully it's not going to be something that, that's going to be too much of a, of a delay. You see that the IR, what the IRB submission should cover, it's really your research proposal. So you're, it's, it, it's, you're, you're writing your research proposal at some point for something, whether it's funding, um, as a proposal for your dissertation or whatever it might be. These are the kinds of things that, that the IRB is going to want to know in addition to things like consent, how privacy is going to be um, protected, and also how your data is going to be stored and secured. So thinking of the practicalities, if you're in the field and you're collecting on your laptop, 
How are you going to secure that data on your laptop or on an external drive before you get back to the university? And then is it there going to go into the university secure storage system? And most universities now have very established policies about how they store and secure research data. So those are the kinds of things that you'll also want to be telling the IRB about so they'll know. Consent, um, there are many ways you can get consent. The traditional written consent form, which says, you know, this research is doing X, this is how your data is going to be used and shared, and I agree, and some of these signs. But what if you're working with a, a language that has no writing system? What if um, a study participant um, cannot read? Or just because of practicalities in the field of wherever you're collecting, or for other reasons, uh, the form doesn't work. So it's perfectly fine to have recorded oral consent. This usually happens when the researcher or somebody in your, on your team reads a script to, um, to a participant that's going to contain the elements needed for it to obtain consent. And then the verbal consent is recorded either um, by audio or video. For web-based studies, click-through consent is also fine, as long as the different screens or the, the main consent screen is showing the pertinent information. And for some studies, taking certain action is going to imply consent, and that would be spelled out in your, in your research plan. It's also um, possible, and you should, if, if your study demands it, collect data from children. There are well-established principles for getting parent or guardian consent, and then minor assent. And each, each institutional review board usually has its own um, procedures or guidelines for how old a child is to assent to a study. So you'll have to see what those are for your particular case. Um, you see how privacy and ethics can come into play a bit, uh, both in, the, in just in terms of the research and in the IRB. I think one thing just to know is there's no single law in the United States that governs data privacy or protecting personal information. The approach in the U.S. has always been we're going to just manage it in a particular sector or sphere. I think one of the ones we're most familiar with is HIPAA for healthcare information because that affects all of us. But um, in addition to GDPR, there are many countries around the world that now have data protection laws. So um, those could come into play uh, if you're collecting data in another country. Um, but the notion that's grown up in research um, in, this, in, in, in failing this kind of um, framework is the notion of personal identifying information. And what that really comes down to, and of course it's not defined in the common rule, some federal agencies define it. But really, it's the idea is things like a person's name, their address, their email, their telephone number. These are generally, this is generally the kind of information that's collected for contact and compensation purposes. So the notion is, is that that data has to be stored separately from the research data in a, in a separate database, and then is connected usually through some um, anonymized PIN or other method of, of de-identifying the data. Um, but you should also just think about any threat of re-identification, even if you've got an anonymized database. Um, if you, you know, we've heard a lot, and there are certain there are weapons of mass destruction, and other books about sort of the dark side of algorithms, but this notion that, you know, you only need like three data points to re-identify a person. So there's that piece. But I think in terms of this community and um, the work that you do, um, it might be more in the case, let's say, of a minority language community. It's a small community that's being studied. So even if even if the participant's um, personal information doesn't appear in your data set, if it's a small community and depending on what they're saying or who you know who the players are, it's something that somebody can figure out who they are. And in some communities, there could be some retribution, and particularly if the community might be under some sort of political oppression. So that's something just to think about as well. And then on the flip side. <coughs> We know of communities of participants who want to share their personal information in a data set are very happy that somebody is studying the language. Intellectual property, and I'm sure you're like, oh no, do I really have to worry about this? And you, you do um, in, in some degree. Um, and the question of who owns the language, that's a great legal question, and I don't think there's, there's really an answer to that. But this ties in again to this idea that language communities may claim some ownership rights over a language. So you need to be sensitive to that and work within that. And sometimes those claims might also relate to non-language data that's, that's collected about the community, how the community operates or certain processes or rituals or things like that. Um, 
We all know the web is a great place to collect data. In fact, there have been many papers here in NWAVE about using different web sources for data. So I think there, the issue is being aware of copyright rights, and it, it comes up in different ways. So, so there's licenses that um, appear on the websites and tell you what the terms are in terms of how the data can be used. Um, there are more or less what we call the open source licenses. Creative Commons has many um, varieties and others, and they can be generally favorable to say, you can use this data, you can modify it, you can share it. Um, sometimes there's explicit permission from a data provider. My data is in the public domain, or I want you to use it for any purpose. And then there's fair use. And I think in the research community, the, the reaction to that is, hey, I'm, I'm doing research, so I can use fair use, because fair use you know, protects researchers who want to use copyrighted data. And that's true to a point, but what I would, what I would urge everyone here is to apply this, this with caution. Um, because fair use is actually an analysis that involves uh, uh, several factors, not just whether you're making commercial use or just only research use of the data. So this is something you want to think about before you just say, hey, I, I think I should, I should be able to collect my data under fair use. Um, and there are resources that you can check at your university, I think, to, to hopefully help you with this. Um, and then the other thing is website terms of use, and those are all those buttons usually are at the bottom, terms and conditions, terms of use, privacy policies. And this is another place where um, a collection can get derailed, because this is where if you read it, they'll say things like, you can download one copy of this, of my web, uh, from, from the website for your personal non-commercial use. You can't modify, you can't distribute any of this data. This is also where you might find that they'll say, you know, we have, we're providing data from other third party websites and we're making no representations about your ability to use that data that might come from somebody else other than me. So, um, again, something to be aware of when you're looking at web sources. When it's time to look at an archive for depositing your data, um, we know, and using NSF as an example, that um, they're not necessarily going to recommend an archive, although we know that the Dell program, Documenting Endangered Languages, now requires that data be deposited in an, in an uh, archive that's received the data seal of approval certification. And this is a certification that was made uh, by an organization in the Netherlands, um, which um, meant that a, archives met certain standards of rights management access and so on. Um, that's now been su superseded by something called the Core Trust Seal, which is an enhanced set of standards that repositories much, must meet. And these are guidelines that have been developed jointly by the World Data System and the Data Seal of Approval. So I'm happy to say actually that the LDC catalog has the Core Trust Seal certification, which means that we're a trustworthy repository. So. Um, those are things that you, that's something that you want to um, think about when you're choosing an archive. And basically, we think that a good choice is an archive that follows accepted standards and best practices for digital resources. So from here on out, when I talk about some of these things, I'm really going to be referring more or less to LDC, but I think these are also some general considerations that many other archives follow, at least in whole or in part. So you want to think about, is the archive going to perform quality checks on my data? And what about its stability? Is it going to be here 10 years from now if somebody's looking for my data set? Um, and even if it's still there, how easy is it going to be for somebody to find the data? And what sort of standards are going to be applied to metadata and tools and documentation? Because in addition to the data set itself, it's a lot of these other surrounding things that enhance the data set's usability and that um, I think you want to be sure is if are, are handled properly so that and a user can come to the data set and use it for the purpose for which it was intended. So all of these things, we know um, data management plans and funders will allow the costs for archiving services and encourage, they actually encourage researchers that these costs should be included in the research proposal. So budgets for archiving are there. How to, how to assess those costs, some archives will say, well, it should just be a percentage. So we have heard of archives that say, 20% of your reward should be set aside to deal with the, with the curation and the distribution of data. Other archives will try to work out a budget that's really more realistic in terms of what the, what the particular collection is, and that's something that we um, at LDC do. 
Um, and we also know that part of the budgets that you can submit as part of your data management plan will cover any distribution costs to users, but that, for instance, NSF says incremental costs of distribution are something that can be passed on to users as well. So sometimes there can be a sharing model where you're going to have the funder subsidize some pieces of cost of distribution and then maybe there'll be some other cost sharing piece. Chris was mentioning standards and I think one, um, in addition to what he talked about, um, there, the FAIR standard, which is one that's getting a lot of traction internationally, I think is one that we're going to be hearing more about and it touches on the things that Chris was talking about the data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And I think it's only fair to say that as open data initiatives only increase in, um, in their importance, that standards like this are going to become um, more important for us to be aware of, not less. When it comes to licensing your data set, um, which means how are you controlling access, I think there's some confusing terms that people use when they talk about how they want their data distributed. So many people will say, I want my data to be freely available. Well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean you don't want anyone to pay? You want anyone who wants it to get it? Can it be modified? Can people use it commercially? So I think when you're thinking through the licensing, you have to touch on all of the various things that play into what access involves. So again, open source licensing can be a good solution. Um, it may not necessarily mean that, that the data would automatically be cost-free. Some open source licenses do um, can carry fees if people want them to, to do so. Um, but also some, some varieties of um, open source licenses prohibit derivatives, which means the data can't be modified, um, and they put restrictions on sharing. And some other open source licenses have what we call viral terms which means that any modification of the data set has to carry the same license that was originally placed on, on the original um, corpus. And we know that from our own experience that some organizations um, just don't license open source data for that reason. They have their own internal licensing policies about how they can use third party data and how that integrates with whatever tools or things they're doing. So sometimes choosing a license that has a viral term can affect um, the, the, extent, uh, the, the extent to which it can be used in the community. Um, and some people say, and I just want my data to be used for research. I'm doing research. I just want it to benefit other researchers. That's obviously a choice that anyone can make about their data. And I would just say here um, that thinking about language technologies and language generally, um, think of where we are uh, as far as things like phone apps and machine translation etc. Um, and that there's a lot of concern uh, among people around the world that all of these systems are based on English and the major languages and that there are many languages that are just being ignored by language technologies, forcing communities to do things in English or these other languages, not their own language. So that by collecting data as many of you do in languages that might be underrepresented generally uh, and not as represented in terms of resources for language technologies, um, having some idea of how some of this data can be exploited um, into things like apps and enhancing machine translations and other things can be something that um, also is going to be a worthwhile contribution that can be made with, with data that you collect. In terms of the LVC license model, LVC data can be used for language-related research, education, and technology development. Um, and uh, we're a consortium, we're membership-based, and our members include government, academia, and industry. Um, this was this idea back in the 90s that these three, these three groups needed to cooperate in order to assure scientific progress and data sharing, et cetera. So most of the data that we distribute can be used for, by our for-profit members for commercial development. Um, and, license, and our data members, uh, our LDC members and data licensees, uh, cannot distribute the data outside of their organizations, but an organization can be defined very broadly. It could be an entire university, a lab, a department, and so on. We also have um, a lot of, we, a fair amount of our data that we distribute for research only purposes or that have other restrictions. Because we're a rights intermediary, if data providers come to us and say, we'd like you to, to distribute this corpus for us, but for these reasons, the data has to be distributed under these terms, 
we accommodate that. Um, we can also say that um, uh, if we get requests that somebody wants to commercially exploit a data set, then we send it back to the purpose provider, and then that's a discussion that um, the two of them have between them. And then, as Chris mentioned, um, we issue special licenses across a range of types to support share task and share task and common technology evaluation. And this is another great way um, to have your data set out there uh, that people are using it in challenges and uh, writing papers about their experiences. So it's a way to, it's a way to propagate um, your work. So then when you're thinking again, well, how am I, once I choose the archive and figure out all these things, how is my data going to be distributed or, or hosted? So um, for LDC, we offer these two options. We're either a host or we're a host and a distributor. And I think most funders recognize that your post project data, you know, when the project ends, that what you should really be doing is that's at the point that you should be depositing it somewhere. Even if you know that you have further work to do on it, to process it, um, to make it available for distribution, or even if you're not going to distribute it for some period of time to work on it, it should be someplace where you know that it's going to be secure until you're ready to get back and do it. So if you're, if you're, if you're willing to take that step, then the kinds of things we're talking to people about are things like Curation, there are curation <coughs> services, which are things like storage, backup, and security. And then, in addition to that, you might say, well, now my data is ready to distribute, and I just want you really to be the host. So I just want people to be able to come to some URL and push a button and get the data. And LDC can accommodate that. But under that model, that's a place where then we will apply the extra, what we would call distribution services that we do with data. So again, we're just kind of talking about um, curation-related stuff, and then maybe, depending on how the data is distributed, maybe there might be some um, costs associated with a web download, which we would have to talk about, depending on what the data is. Now, when LDC is both host and distributor, that's when these other um, activities <coughs> come in, and those are things like quality control, because we perform quality checks over every data set that's in our public catalog. Licensing, we'll talk about what the licensing options are and how that's going to work. And customer care, which applies to really administering every aspect of the corpus from, you know, putting it in the catalog and then questions about it, how it's processed through our business system when people license it, and so on. In terms of distribution methods, most of our data is available by web download, um, but still some very large data sets still have to be distributed on media. So when that happens, that implicates media costs and shipping costs. Um, but in terms of web download, the data can come either from our servers, the LDC servers, or sometimes we use third-party hosted servers in the cloud. And so there can be sometimes some extra costs there as well, in, in, depending on the situation. So if we've done this right, <laughs> you can see how all of this is now flowing down into the data management plan. When you look at what NSF's requirements are for the social behavioral proposals, you can see that these are the things that, that we kind of walked through relatively quickly um, for purposes of our discussion today. But what's your research? What are the regulatory issues? What are the plans for archiving the present and, and preservation? So again, I think many institutions now have data management plan resources that you can look at. The library is a good place. Or if you have an office of research services, that's what we call it at Penn. Um, but where grants are kind of processed, that's another place they could be helpful. There are some publicly available tools that kind of walk you through the DMP process, may present decision trees. In LDC, we have a couple of things. We have a data sheet, which we have here, a couple of data sheets here, but one particularly for data management plans. It's also on our website. But we also have an online form, and I just put a screenshot here. This isn't a great image, but you can get to this from our website. I wanted to show you sort of what the, what the length of the form was. It asked a few pertinent questions about the data, what you, would, what you expect its size to be, what language, um, other things that might be pertinent about it. When that form is submitted, it goes to our publications team. And then that starts the discussion about how can, you know, what would your data management plan um, consist of and how we would propose to deal with the particular issues that you've identified there as well as other issues relevant 
uh, to the data management plan. Um, so I also want to say we have data sheets here on sharing data through LVC and also for field work. So you're very welcome to take these and they're also all on our website. So that really brings us to the end of our prepared presentation.